Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here this morning. And I, I will say there's a strong temptation to uh, try to be funny this morning and talk about all the puns about, you know, having a joint bill that everybody hashed out. But the reality is the implications of this particular bill that's up today on the Senate floor are very dire for the state of Minnesota, and it's not a joking matter. We have a number of real concerns about this particular bill. Our caucus has been talking about this for quite some time, and what we've come down to uh, after our analysis is this bill simply isn't enough. Not enough public safety, not enough for, um, not enough for public health, and our local governments are really, really uh, at, at the bad end of the stick of this. Plus, there's way too much subsidi subsidizing of the industry itself, trying to grow it, trying to grow it quickly in this state before it's ready. There's a lot of bureaucracy and red tape, way too much of that. This bill simply is not ready. Senator Nelson is our lead on this bill, and she is going to walk through some of the issues, flesh them out a little bit, and we'll talk a little further about that at the end. So. Senator Thank Nelson. You. Thank you so much. Great to be with you today. Um, as uh, Senator Johnson alluded to, uh, this bill is premature. It is just not ready. And there are many reasons for that. Uh, I'll just list a few of them. Public safety is number one. Our law enforcement uh, are against this bill. There's just too many questions about how, if we can ensure public safety. Uh, number one, we don't have a reliable road test. That is key for driving under the influence of cannabis. It, we don't have like the blood, uh, blood alcohol uh, level. Uh, we don't have clear standards. Our law enforcement don't have clear standards about how to ensure safe driving conditions. But there are a couple things that we do know. So I was telling you what all that we don't have. Uh, but what we do know is that increased cannabis use is associated with increased traffic deaths. So according to the National Institutes of Health, traffic deaths involving marijuana impaired drivers increased 30, 138% for all drivers, 29% uh, since marijuana was legalized in, in, in Colorado alone. So seeing a nearly a third of the increase in traffic deaths just since legalizing marijuana. Um, I know you're familiar with the Governor's Highway uh, Safety Association, and they have noticed that increased uh, impairment cases in Washington since legalization and increases in fatal crashes, as I mentioned, both in Colorado and Washington. And I have the links to those studies if you want those. Uh, now, there are some courses for law enforcement uh, to become trained in uh, cannabis uh, drug impairment, uh, but this bill doesn't fund any of that. And quite frankly, the test isn't ready yet. So another case where it's premature. We don't have the drug impairment test for cannabis. That's critical. Uh, a second big thing is local control. Um, and under this bill, local communities will not be able to deny a cannibal, cannabis license. They'll have limited ability to regulate the number and the location uh, of facilities selling cannabis. And most of us here, we say we're local control. We, uh, we think local control is the closest to the people and the best. And yet we are, we are tying the hands of our local elected officials and we are limiting them from um, the, what they see best uh, for their communities and how to limit the access to cannabis. And the other thing is when there's calls about cannabis uh, misuse, legal cannabis misuse, lighting up in a park with a toddler uh, right there. Where are those kind of calls going to go? Well, they're going to go to our locally elected law enforcement. And they're already stretched thin to the max with increased crime and uh, understaffing shortages of our public safety officials. And now we're going to add more on their plate without additional funding to even help with those public safety calls. And uh, on top of that, on top of not giving fin our, our locally elected uh, officials the financial resources they need, we also restrict them from uh, offering a local cannabis excise tax. So we are restricting them from the resources that they need uh, to keep us safe. And uh, we will see a dramatic increase in staffing needs as a result of this uh, legislation. Uh, in addition, uh, we are vastly concerned about the uh, substance abuse prevention. We're concerned about the health 
of our kids. Uh, we know that states that have legalized recreational marijuana have seen upticks in overdoses and addiction, of course, and that is on top of what we've seen after two years of COVID. Uh, and this bill just does not provide adequate support for that. Um, and we spend a lot of time and resources trying to protect our kids. You know that I've been very much a leader in protecting our kids from tobacco. Um, and it's been a hard challenge. It's been a tough challenge. Uh, and we restrict where those products can be sold. We try and limit them. And we provide great education to try and keep kids with developing brains from uh, using these addictive substances uh, and, um, and really ending up uh, with addiction treatment needs. And yet those type of resources are lacking uh, in this bill today. So in closing, all we can see, all I can see is unmet needs. This bill is premature. Uh, we've lined out just public safety, public health needs, and our local enforcement needs are not at, at not being met. And all we have to do is look at other states and see how this has played out. And it has not been a pretty picture. Some people will say the cannabis tax will pay for this. That's not the case. As you know, in Colorado, for every dollar of tax that's come in, over $4 of uh, government needs have followed every dollar of cannabis tax. So uh, this is very premature. I'm disappointed to see it today. Originally, you know, this was going to be a bill that was coming next year. I'm surprised that it's being pushed so uh, prematurely, uh, such, a, such a bill that has so many challenges. So with that, I'll turn it over to our minority leader for further questions. Thank you, Carla. That was a wonderful job with that. Uh, questions? Senator, you, uh, do you have 33 no votes in your caucus, or are there some still entertaining a possibility of backing this? Well, I'll tell you this. We've, we've gone over this bill several times, and there are some real, real concerns. Uh, Senator Nelson's really done a nice job of outlining what those concerns are within our caucus. Uh, we've got a pretty strong no vote against it. I can't guarantee that, but I will say that uh, there are a lot of concerns that uh, our caucus members uh, don't think this bill is ready for prime time. I mean, at its, at its core, we talked about, Senator Nelson was talking about how you guys believe it's premature. Are there any aspects of legalization that members in your caucus do support, and are there any pros that you see within this bill in particular? That's a great question. I think most of us have seen a lot of the polls that are going on around the state and around the country. I mean, there's growing support for the legalization of cannabis products, right? And so it's not a partisan issue. I think we see them on both sides of it. But the, the real issue is looking at this bill. This is such a convoluted bill with so many different licenses. Look, 15 licenses are included in this one particular bill. I mean, the, the system that they're putting out here creates bureaucracy, new agency, uh, all these different committee or councils that they're going to be having. This bill is a bit of a train wreck. And so that's where our caucus is really pushing back against this particular bill. Do you believe that a tax and regulated market would uh, lessen uh, the chances of, like, say, tainted cannabis uh, hitting the streets, uh, like, as far as, like, allow for more testing and regulating? Um, does a safer market, you know, tested and regulated legal market, does that provide for a safer product coming out? And, and that's, that's a really good question. I think, you know, you look at this bill, does this bill create a safer market for cannabis users? I don't think the guardrails are there. The incentives by taking off the penalties for marijuana use and cannabis use in here, are you're going to see, like in Colorado and other areas, a growing black market there as well. So I don't think this has the guardrails that other, other bills might be able to have. So this is the problem with this particular bill. Are you probably aware that we have the lowest 8% tax rate bill written to the or in the House bill it was to, and they're poising for the um, the lowest percentage. So in my opinion, that would be one of the biggest battles against the black market because in other states it's over regulate it's it's overtaxed. We're not we're not looking to super tax it here, and that would make it more affordable to people who are already potentially getting tainted products on the black market that's already alive and well. In my opinion, you're supporting black market by default. Yeah, I want to answer just that one briefly because I was shaking my head uh, when you asked the question, and I want to be clear about that. Um, clearly, what's happened in other states, legalizing recreational marijuana has not dried up the black market for some of the reasons you mentioned, and that is a great concern. It has not dried up the black market, and in some states, the black market has continued to grow. And in talking to local uh, law enforcement, 
in my district, they're concerned that simply um, legalizing recreational marijuana will make it even harder to interdict and stop those who are working in the black market. So there's, it's not going to be less expensive uh, as, uh, as legal, and it, the, we're tying the hands of law enforcement in even regulating the black market. Thank you for question. Senator, Senator Nelson, the, the Senate bill has uh, money that would go to local governments out of the tax pot that, that comes in, and there would be the, the ability to restrict the number of licenses based on population. It's not in the House bill. Do you feel like the Senate bill is closer to where this needs to go? Well, there's two things. Uh, number one, I appreciate the substantial funding for law enforcement in the tax bill. We saw that yesterday. Uh, it's, it's, it's substantial. But it kind of reminds me of what's going on with the education bill. Uh, substantial funding for education, but the school districts are sending the spreadsheet saying, we're still going to go into uh, our budget reserves. We're going to have to release teachers. We're going to have to not uh, increase teacher salaries. So we're increasing the demand uh, and the costs on our law enforcement. Uh, but I'm glad to see the additional support in the House, in the Senate tax bill, bill for our public safety. And then your second question, what was that, Brian? I forgot. Uh, is it closer to where you think the, the ultimate compromise needs to go if something is going to pass this year? Well, certainly. On, on the licensure and well, the ability to restrict uh, the number of dispensaries in the Yes, yes. I think that's a plus on the Senate side to have some sort of restriction for licenses, much like we have for alcohol. But the difference is those alcohol licenses, as you know, are very hard to get. Uh, and they come through the legislature. I don't believe that even in the Senate bill it has that stringent control on the local licenses. Kind of following the theme of the two different bills in the House and the Senate, um, we heard on Monday from some House Republicans that there's more provisions for the hemp drive market within the Senate bill. Do you guys have a stance or a, a comment on the hemp drive market and the provisions this bill has on that? Yeah. Sure. Uh, we've had uh, testifiers in the tax committee, as this came before the tax committee, talking about how this is so unfair in the, to, to the hemp market, uh, which uh, I remember years ago uh, when I was on the jobs committee, uh, maybe 10 years ago, uh, we allowed hemp as an agricultural product in Minnesota. And I can remember the senator who brought it, who said, this is, you can't get high on this. This is, you can't get high on this. Don't worry about it. We're not increasing uh, marijuana. But the fact of the matter is we do have a thriving hemp industry in our state. And there was significant, I think, strong testimony in the tax committee about how this is hindering uh, the thriving agricultural uh, hemp industry. Suddenly it's going to face the marijuana taxes and the marijuana regulations, and yet it's a legal product. Whereas marijuana continues to be a Schedule 1, Schedule 1 uh, illegal product at the federal level, FDA, and it will continue that way. Don't you think at least last year's um, hemp edibles bill needs to be fixed? Meaning, doesn't it need to have regulation, taxation, licensing? Uh, even if you don't do cannabis? Absolutely. I absolutely know that. And uh, we need to have those same protections for edibles, much like we worked hard. You know, actually, Senator Dietzik and I worked very hard on this together for a number of years. Uh, as far as candy-flavored cigarettes, marketing uh, candy-flavored vapes to kids. And you know what? It's very interesting. The marijuana industry now is owned by the tobacco companies. So I certainly hope we do not see many of those uh, big tobacco-type issues that were really focused on students, on kids. Can you speak to the sort of the criminal justice and social justice issues in the bill? Expungement, for instance, could expungement go ahead absent a broader bill? Um, could you decriminalize absent a broader bill? And are those things you would support? An attorney will let you speak. That sounds good. Yeah, I, I think when you're looking at this bill, there are a number of things that people do like uh, in there as well. I think a lot of Minnesotans, when you ask those questions about the decriminalization or the legalization aspect of it. There are aspects that, that deserve a conversation, but to be wrapped up in this convoluted bill really kind of muddies the water on, the, on those sorts of issues that are going on. You know, the hemp is in there, the licensing, all the different regulations and taxation. That's why this bill went through, I think it was 12 committee stops. 
uh, is because it is such a monster. And so now ideas that we, we might be able to have those discussions on have been tainted by all the other work that's, that's going on in this thing. So uh, again, this bill as it's brought to the floor today is not ready. And that is the bottom line. So, uh, you know, we can have those discussions next year. We can have those down the line. But, but I think trying to shoehorn those in this one has really been uh, a bad deal for those sorts of conversations. If, if the DFL can come together on this bill, it's, it's going to pass. Are you guys going to, if that's the case, you know, try and introduce more regulations and, and whatnot in future sessions, maybe even this year, you know, looking to kind of address some of the problems you guys have with this particular bill? So I, I think Nancy Pelosi had that quote a few years ago, we're going to pass this bill and then figure out what's in it. So I, what we keep hearing is over the next 18 months, there's going to be rulemaking involved to try to figure out how they're going to fix the mistakes that are in the bill and how to make it workable. And we've heard that over and over again over the last, you know, almost session here. Uh, that's what we're passing right now. A bill that they're admitting is going to take many, many months of work just to try to make this uh, something that, that will work for Minnesota or at least get the functioning up. So we don't really know what we're passing on this bill because the agencies and different organizations are going to be fixing the rules for you know, the next 18 months. Are you talking about the potency? And, and they, they say that the potency should be left to the experts and not necessarily to lawmakers who don't really have experience in this area. Do you want the legislature to, to put potency limits in there? I think what we need to do is establish a system that we can all agree on that could do things just like that, the, the potency and whatnot. They have the Office of Cannabis Management. They have the Council for Cannabis. They have all these different organizations. But the reality is that we get held accountable to our, uh, to our folks back in our districts for the work that's done at the, at the state here, at the state government. So I want to be involved in that. Our caucus wants to be involved in that. We need to have a say in that. We can't just give it up to the executive branch and then say, well, it's their fault. No, we're going to be held accountable to this. So I want to have a more of a say, and our caucus does too. Just to add to that, uh, the Office of uh, Cannabis Management is a new department with 300 new government employees, uh, state government employees, with uh, paychecks, pensions, those type of things. And uh, as uh, Senator Johnson said, I encourage you to read the bill. It's, it gives an immense amount of power to this new Office of Cannabis Management. Immense amount of power. And uh, so it, I, it, I get the sense that even from the bill authors, <clears throat> this bill is being rushed through. If I were putting forth a bill like that, I would make sure that I had a few more I's dotted and T's crossed. But this is a very, um, very premature bill. That was actually going to lead into my, my next question, and, and I was going to ask about the Office of Canada, Cannabis Management. How do you guys feel about the way that that's set up in the bill? You know, um, how those positions are going to be hired, who's going to have a say in how these things are regulated. Do you guys have a stance on that? I'm going to let the majority leader take the mo or the minority leader. I like that first phase better. Uh, um, take the, the f to, to take, take, take a bigger crack at that. But I would just say, in going through the legislation, that's the problem. Uh, section after section says the Office of Cannabis Management will determine, and then it goes on and on and on. And to the point that it's unelected and appointed by the executive is a concern. I don't have any more to add. I think you, you hit on it. I mean, we, that's a huge concern that we have, is that it can take, it'll take all the power we have at the legislative branch away and put it in the executive to make these decisions. So um, for us, it's just, it's another bureaucracy that's going to have an immense expense and it's going to suck up a lot of that tax revenue that you see within this bill itself. Are there some things that you would need to see in a, tech, in a cannabis bill to hypothetically support it? What, what would make this bill look better for you in a hypothetical situation? Look, we're just looking at this bill today. That's what we're talking about. Are, are there any bills? Um, I forgot what the question was going to be. So. I was going to ask, are there any changes that could be made in conference to make this slightly more palatable to you guys? Or, or is there like no version of this bill that you would support as it stands? I would never close the door on possibilities in the future, but certainly you want to scrutinize them very well. Uh, so it's really hard to say yes or no on um, a hypothetical when we don't even know what the hypothetical is. But definitely this bill, premature, not ready for prime time, dangerous for Minnesotans. 
Senator Nelson, do you want to be on the conference committee? Oh. I haven't given that a thought. Uh, I'm pretty focused on taxes and, uh, and this bill today. All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you.